Does where you're born affect your health? How about your ability to earn a decent wage? Does where you're born affect your likelihood of graduating from high school? At a glance, factors like location, income, and education aren't intuitively linked to health. Yet a groundbreaking new Hamilton Spectator investigation shows where you're born and the conditions that you're born into are intimately linked with your health, wealth, and future prospects. Yep. Of course you're thinking, someone born into a wealthy family will naturally have more opportunities. But our analysis of half a million provincial birth records shows more. Adverse birth outcomes, things like teen motherhood, low birth weights, and lack of prenatal care are highest in Ontario, where income and educational achievements are low and poverty is high. Meanwhile, low incidences of poor birth outcomes are closely tied to higher levels of educational achievement, higher income, and lower levels of poverty. Our analysis of Ontario's communities exposes wide gulfs in birth outcomes between the provinces have and have not hubs. At the level of individual neighbourhoods, the findings are even more compelling. We found that where you live within a city can put you on a precarious path for life, even before you're born. My name is Terry Pekoski. I'm a reporter at the Hamilton Spectator and one of the co-authors of the Born series. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone in the audience and anyone who's watching from home or on the spec.com uh, to our open forum for BORN, a Code Red project. The series was published in our newspaper over the past three weekends, but it's been months, if not years, in the making. BORN evolved out of the Spectator's landmark Code Red series, which uncovered massive variations in health and wealth between Hamilton neighborhoods. Like Code Red, the BORN project reveals intimate links between health and wealth but this time on a province-wide scale. Our examination of more than half a million provincial birth records shows birth outcomes such as teen motherhood, low birth weight, and poor rates of early prenatal care are not only elevated in Hamilton's at-risk neighborhoods. They're also linked to low income, low educational achievement, and high rates of poverty in communities and neighborhoods all across Ontario. It was September when my editors asked me to team up with my colleague and investigative reporter, Steve Bust, on this project. Uh, but for Steve, Bourne really began where and when Code Red left off. He was sifting through data and planning this new series uh, long before I was brought on board. Steve is extremely passionate about this topic and he knows it inside out. In a few minutes, he'll tell you a bit more about its genesis uh, but first, I'd like to introduce our other panelists tonight. They are all individuals who are experts in their respective fields and who have all, in one way or another, helped Steve and I better grasp the implications of our findings for Ontario's mothers and babies. First, to Steve's right, is Neil Johnson. Neil is an epidemiologist at Hamilton's Firestone Institute for Respiratory Health and a faculty member in McMaster University's Department of Medicine He's also an expert in analyzing health data and a collaborator on the BORN series, as well as Code Red. Uh, Neil has been a phenomenal resource when it comes to understanding what makes healthcare systems tick. His expertise and assistance was also invaluable in organizing this massive set of statistics. Uh, to Neil's right is Dr. Chris Mackey, actually on the far end there. Uh, he's one of Hamilton's associate medical officers of health. As a physician, he encounters maternal health issues firsthand, day in and day out. Um, as a result of this experience, he was able to provide us with important insight into the health of Hamilton's mothers and babies. And finally, Lee Caragata, who is uh, directly to Chris's left, who is a professor in the Faculty of Social Work at Wilfrid Laurier University. She has extensive experience studying, studying single and at-risk mothers and she played a role in helping Steve and I better understand some of the issues surrounding teen motherhood. Um, I'd like to move on now to the sort of the first portion of our show by inviting our panelists to take the floor for a few minutes apiece to speak about the significance of the Born Project. Um, I'm going to get started with Steve, who I'm hoping will also explain a bit more about how, uh, how this series evolved out of Code Red. Steve? Okay, thank you, Terry. You know, Code Red was really a once-in-a-lifetime project, I think. Uh, anyone who lives in Hamilton, I think, um, can appreciate a little bit the impact that the series has had on the city. 
Um, it, in some ways, it, it showed us a lot of things that you know, seem very obvious once you've read about them, but you wouldn't have thought of. And uh, I think what made the series so powerful, the original series, was that um, it was so local. It was, a, it was an excellent tool for the, for the people of Hamilton and for the city of Hamilton. And I think really what helped make the series um, easily digestible for people was that you know there were a lot of maps and you know we're fortunate enough to have the gentleman who made the maps uh, for us, Pat DeLuca, he's here in the audience tonight. Uh, he's also from McMaster University. But it was quite easy to, to look at these maps and instantly see what was going on in the city of Hamilton and map after map, marker after marker, variable after variable kept showing the same thing, these strong links between uh, you know, poverty, where you lived, your health. And I think that really offended a lot of people that live here in Hamilton. I think um, it was offensive to some people to think that there are these huge disparities within our city, that there are people that are living with, you know, not ex without exaggeration, people who are living with third world health conditions. Um, so my colleague Neil and I, we, you know, obviously spent a lot of time thinking about this. And then we thought, wh what can we do to, to take this message to the next level? And what more important message can we get across than looking at moms and babies? I mean, that really is the foundation of who and what we are as, as a society. And so we thought that one way to sort of take this code red message and expand on it was to move outside of the borders of Hamilton and take a look at the entire province and see if these same trends that we were seeing within Hamilton are manifested or show themselves across the province. So we made an application, we received uh, 535,000 pieces of data related to four years worth of uh, birth outcomes for the entire province. And the beauty of the Born Project was that, like the Code Red series, we were able to break these numbers down into neighborhoods right across the entire province. Of course, the challenge then becomes, how do you tell a story that massive to an audience that's here in Hamilton? Because, you know, frankly, people are less interested in specific neighborhoods of Windsor or Kingston or Ottawa or Sault Ste. Marie. And so we had to try to figure out, how do you tell this story? Well, lo and behold, as you can see, these same trends are existing right across the province that we saw in Code Red. Places that have high levels of poverty, places that have low incomes, um, they, they have much poorer performances for a number of health markers uh, than those people who live in wealthy places. I think some of the statistics that you saw for the rates of teen mothers are just absolutely um, almost beyond belief. I mean, we have places where there are thousands of women who gave birth over four years and not a single one of them was a teen mother. Um, meanwhile, we have rates of teen mothers in places such as, um, you know, the inner cities of of uh, you know some of the parts of the province that are hurting Hamilton, Thunder Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, uh, Windsor, and of course, as the series showed, places in the far north, remote fly-in native reserves, where the rates of teen mothers are basically off the charts. So, I, I think the, the the beauty of the Born series was that we were able to show that right across this province these same problems are happening. And so uh, it's not just about figuring out a made in Hamilton solution, it's about how do we figure out a made in Ontario solution to some of these problems. Great, thanks Steve. Uh, and we'll move on now to Neil. Thanks Terry. Um, for me this is personal. Um, Steve and I often disagree about the way we're going to do these kinds of projects. Um, more in the details than anything else, the broad objectives less so. But um, creating data, working with data, um, producing maps, producing tables, and publishing it so that you, the readers, can see it um, is wonderful. But my motivation for this is, is really goes further than that, and that is that both outcomes are fundamentally important to our society. 
they're an index by which our society is ranked compared to other societies. And frankly, given the wealth of this province, given the education, given all of the resources we have, it's really not very good. So my motivation is really quite simple. Let's make it a political agenda. Let's make birth outcomes and the improvement of birth outcomes political. And this story, this series, if you wish, which wasn't just uh, published in The Spectator, there were clones of it that appeared in other papers that belong to the group across the province, hopefully will stimulate the kind of public debate that we need to have around this in order to motivate political action. Fantastic. Thanks, Neil. Uh, Lee, go ahead. Um, I just, I first of all, want to, I guess, commend the spectator for doing a story <coughs> like this. I think that um, as pressures are on our news media to um, come up with shorter, faster, cheaper, um, a story that's as investigative and as in-depth as this, um, I think, becomes rarer. So I just, I really want to kind of acknowledge that because I do think it's important. I think it's important to kind of get these kinds of messages out. Um, and as Neil suggests, I think it begins to create a kind of public discussion that ideally can create some kind of political agenda to deal with these kinds of things. And I just, I want to tell you a, a little story. My research for the last 10 years has been on single mothers on social assistance. And we've done a longitudinal qualitative research, so interviews, um, where we're interviewing the same single mother-led families across Canada every eight to 12 months for a five-year period of time. So we've really come into these women's households and understand them. And there's a, a particular family that I interviewed five times. Um, and over the course of that, I um, saw this woman's daughter, uh, who's exactly the same age as my daughter, so there's a kind of personal resonance there, um, come home at 16 and tell her mom that she was pregnant. Uh, and there was tremendous family <clears throat> distress because that family had had a lot of hope and a lot of aspirations built into kind of their plans for their daughter. Um, and those were, were thwarted, but Chantelle is the young woman's name, and she said, and that's a, a code name, it's not her real name, but um, she said, you know, actually it probably doesn't really matter, Mom, very much because like the school I go to, in her words, um, sucks. And not very many people from that high school go on to university anyway. And, you know, I'll love the baby and we'll do a good job together and I've got a lot of family support. And I think her view of that situation was, was quite realistic. This wasn't a family that had the resources to send their daughter off to university. Um, there were all kinds of limitations right from the word go in that family's circumstance and structure um, that made teen parenting in that circumstance still not a good thing by any stretch. But it wasn't as if she could compare her life outcomes to those of more privileged people for whom that would have been a much more negative circumstance. And of course, we see through that little illustration the way in which those kinds of cycles of poverty continue because we have now a, a you know, poorly educated, low-skilled single mom who's going to do a good job of being a parent or try to do a good job of being a parent, but she's not going to be able to create the same kinds of possibilities for her kid as somebody with more privilege. Um, and yet the very root of that is the kind of extraordinary levels of poverty and those po the poverty that we experience in Canada remains gendered. And for single mother-led families, which are uh, the vast majority of, of single parent families in the country, um, poverty is, is much higher and really intractable unless we really start to invest in the kind of education and training that'll help to move people out of poverty. And that doesn't seem to be something that we're very oriented to doing. Great, thanks Lee. Uh, Dr. Chris Mackey, go ahead. Sure, thanks Terry. And I also wanna commend the spectator and staff on really doing uh, a really important story about a tough, complicated issue. Um, low birth weight, teenage pregnancies, these are some really important indicators, um, but they're also part of a whole, whole larger issue, and that's how well do we set up 
our children and our young people for success? What kind of opportunities do we give them? Um, what kind of start are we giving them in life? And we know that those early years are absolutely critical for predicting how people do for the rest of their lives. It has a huge impact on health, social success, economic success for, for the lifespan. And so, you know, while there are other indicators to look at, um, you know, looking at low birth weight and looking at teenage pregnancy are really important parts of that story. And um, I think it's also really easy to turn a blind eye uh, and ignore the issue because for many people, you know, maybe you've had your kids already, maybe you don't see it on a regular basis. It's, it's hard to connect these issues, low birth weight, teenage pregnancy, with, with uh, people's lives. Um, but the, the connections are real and they're strong. And, you know, I think, you know, the series did a good job of pointing out some of those connections in terms of the impact on healthcare costs. We know that low, low birth weight children cost something like $80,000 more within the first five years in terms of healthcare costs. But then through the rest of the lifespan, you know, it, looking at uh, social service utilization, social assistance, um, you know, healthcare through the lifespan, it, it has a huge difference, uh, a huge impact. And in terms of educational attainment of, the, of those children, it, it just, it's, it's, um, it's such a powerful f factor. Um, on the other hand, you've also got, for every statistic, you've got an individual story that, that tells, you know, the opposite story. Um, for every study showing that uh, low birth weight causes all sorts of problems in life. You've got a, a person that grows up from low birth weight and becomes successful. And every time, you know, we talk about teenage pregnancies and how difficult it is for the mother and the, and the child, you know, you hear stories about, well, I did it with my kids and they turned out great. And uh, I mean, I've got a colleague at uh, City of Hamilton Public Health who was a teenage mom. And, you know, she uh, she's She's an absolute pleasure to work with. She's a wonderful person. That makes a huge positive contribution to uh, the work in our office, and has a has a daughter that's doing great and just about to finish high school. And you know that that experience was part of what she is now. Uh, and so you know that's that's a really positive, hopeful thing that there there are uh, you know people that do well in spite of those difficult circumstances. But it doesn't change the fact that those are really difficult circumstances, and they they. Um, you know, so wh where's the impact on the rest of us? Well, it's fairly obvious, you know, the healthcare impact, the social services, social assistance impact. We're also learning more and more about how um, income inequality in communities affects everybody in those communities. Um, there's now growing data and, and um, replicated here in Canada showing that the more income inequality you have in your community, you know, there will be more teenage pregnancies, there'll be more murders, there's going to be more health <laughs> problems in general, because you don't have that community cohesion. And so that's another really, you know, obvious way where this, these sorts of issues affect all of us directly in our daily lives. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, I think what I'll do right now is get things started with um, a couple of questions for our panelists and then later um, we'll take a little break and then I'll open up the floor to public questions. Um, so I think I'm going to start with Neil, if you don't mind. Um, one of the things that Steve and I found is that over the past 15 years or so, the province has uh, made massive investments in the healthcare system. But birth outcomes, and I have in mind particularly low birth weight, um, it's not improving. It's actually getting significantly worse. Why is that happening? There's an old proverb, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And what I mean by that is that, uh, and I've had some recent experiences which emphasize this, the health system in Ontario is really very, very good, um, if you're in it. Um, it's second to none. In the case of pregnancy outcomes, um, most women enter the care system, obtain prenatal care in an appropriate way, um, and go forward to deliver healthy children. That is the norm. Many people, for many reasons, ignorance, fear, language, um, many other things, 
elect not to do that. They don't obtain the care. Um, and that, in a sense, if you like, is, is their option, their right, if I can put it that way. But the system that we have is fundamentally passive. It waits for something to happen, and then it steps in. Um, in the case of pregnancy outcomes where the children who were born become, in a sense, trustees of all of us. We're all responsible for the children in this province. And to have a system that does not go to the next step to include people who otherwise will not seek care, even when they will benefit from it, and more particularly when their children will benefit from it, is something that I find objectionable. Um, I think the notion that that is acceptable is simply wrong. So we need to go active, as is the case in a number of other countries. Great. Thanks, Neil. Does anyone else want to weigh in? <laughs> Can you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think Neil also pointed out in his essay that, um, or in his comments in the last piece uh, of the series, that, um, you know, it's fine to set a goal uh, to, to try to achieve, but if you don't put the framework into place to allow that goal to be achieved, it just becomes sort of an empty number. It's an empty, you know, sort of it's almost an empty promise. And so, uh, you know, there needs to be, if, if people are going to say, we're going to move this needle this much this way, you need to figure out what you have to put into place to make that happen. And if you don't put that into place, you shouldn't be surprised when those targets aren't met. So, Terry, just to add on to that, um, you were asking, I remember now, about um, whether, you know, why is it that we have an excellent healthcare system, yet we still have some of these outcomes that are not excellent? Yeah. Well, um, I think Neil's answered a good part of that, but, but Lee's stories were really powerful as well because, you know, this is one of those issues that's well beyond healthcare, and the healthcare system can't do it. And even if you're getting into healthcare, uh, even if you get good prenatal care, um, you know, you're already pregnant, so it's not going to help the teenage pregnancy issue. Uh, if you're if you're smoking, that has a huge impact on low birth weight. If you if you don't have access to good nutrition, that has a huge impact on the on the child's development as well. Um, but if we back up a bit and ask the questions about children, uh, you know, let's be honest, children choosing to have children, um, you know, the story that Lee pointed out, I think, is really salient because it talks about somebody who didn't have opportunities, didn't have an opportunity to get a good education, didn't have the opportunity to get a good job. Um, and when you don't have opportunity, why not? Um, there's, no, there's no risk to having kids because your life can't get a lot worse. And in fact, it might be more fun to have a little kid around. Um, and, and this is actually, I think, where, where this, this issue really points out an opportunity as well. Because having a child is a life-changing event. Uh, it's a life-changing event that some people want and, and are, are seeking for a life change. And um, we're now, we now have good programs that, to support people that are going through that life change, to give them the tools to be good parents through, the, through their child's, child's upbringing. Um, and it, so, you know, it really is a, a, an amazing opportunity to get in, involved in supporting somebody to build their resilience, their capacity, uh, to empower them to make a difference in their lives. Um, the Nurse Family Partnership is one program that we're running in Hamilton. It's an outreach-based uh, program that that partners a nurse with a mom and, and really does that empowerment um, uh, sort of approach and has shown in numerous studies to be a really effective uh, approach but there's 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 other things that make a difference there as well we've got supportive housing in Hamilton where um, teenage moms can get continue on with their high school education um, and there's there's a bunch of you know outreach based and and um, and thoughtful ways of dealing with the problem that recognize that it's not just about getting you into medical care. Great. 
Thanks, Chris. Um, and you mentioned the Nurse Family Partnership Program. That's um, just one of our uh, local programs that are designed to help sort of at-risk mothers. Um, one of the things that Steve and I sort of struggled with, because there are so few hard targets um, that have been set with respect to maternal care, it's who's responsible. Uh, so following up on uh, our previous discussion, who, uh, Steve, who's responsible for, for monitoring this and for holding people accountable for meeting, you know, targets if they are set? Well, I mean, you know, that's, that's the $64,000 question. I think if any of the people on, on this panel had that answer. You know, I think Chris uh, said it, you know, both during Code Red and, and for this Born project, you know, if there were simple solutions to these problems, they would have been implemented by now. It's not that people are, are fundamentally stupid and don't know what they're supposed to do. Um, you know, obviously, it's a multi, uh, multi-headed problem. It requires federal intervention. It's, it requires provincial interventions to the extent that the city has a role to play. It, it involves municipal interventions. Um, you know, it, it's fine and dandy to, to always point the fingers at at levels of government, it's it's that level of government, it's this level of government, but you know, at at some point, it's also all of our problem to try to figure out as a community as well, and communities across Ontario. Um, you know, at some point, we have to make decisions about what's the right way to be spending our money. I mean, as the series pointed out, I was stunned when I went back because. Uh, you know, you mentioned the hard targets. In 1997, the provincial government set this hard target. It wanted to get the rate of low birth weight babies. Uh, at the time, it was 5.7%. It wanted to get it down to 4%. The government wanted to get it to 4% by 2010. Well, we showed in the series that, in fact, not only did 4% not be achieved, it went the other way. It got worse. And I looked up the numbers. In 1997, the health budget for the province of Ontario was $17 billion. In 2010, it was $44 billion. $44 billion. So think of the rise, $17 billion to $44 billion in 13 years. That's a massive inf influx of money. And the problem got worse, you know? And it's not just low birth weight baby rates that got worse. We saw wait times get worse for different types of procedures emergency room problems, etc. So there's, it's, no, it's not that there's a shortage of money, it's the question of how are we spending that money? And you know, time and time again, we, we seem to have the same discussion. We seem reluctant to spend that little bit of money on the front end, relative little bit of money on the front end for the, prevented, you know, for the prevention, and yet we will spend limitless amounts of money on the back end to try to fix problems that have already developed. You know, but you know, as as you know, we're talking really about the the social determinants of health here. I mean, a lot of these problems that show up as being medical problems really had a fundamental basis, perhaps a long time ago, in issues that had nothing to do with medicine. And how do you fix those problems? I wish I knew. And I'm quite happy to let the other three try and give a better answer than that. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to comment, I have to say, and I, I'm glad you added what you did there, Steve, because I, I, th I think the issue is that we are trying to kind of address a problem that is a deeply structural economic problem with healthcare dollars, and I don't think we're going to ever be able to kind of have enough healthcare dollars to address that. And these problems arise because of poverty and um, you know youth unemployment in Ontario is now an average 24 percent and so if you think about what that means you know because that's a flattened figure where we average the unemployment of a group of 22 and 23 year olds who are coming out of university with a first degree and those people like many of the young women having low, low birth weight babies who perhaps are 16 and 17 um, and don't have completed high school. And so obviously for that latter population, youth unemployment is much higher than that 24%. So when you think about what the opportunities are for those young people, they're pretty minimal. 
um, and yet we have a federal government that isn't really trying to address that kind of structural unemployment. Um, we have a kind of economic system that really isn't acknowledging increasing inequality, as, as the study points out, the kind of increasing inequality that creates the kind of haves and have-nots. And so I think if we really kind of want to see that needle move um, toward uh, decreasing down to 4% or even much less than that, kind of um, people having low birth weight babies, we obviously have to deal with kind of structural poverty that is among us everywhere. And, you know, if you think about the reality of somebody who's uh, a single parent on social assistance, you know, they're getting perhaps, and I don't know the Hamilton statistics exactly, but relatively comparable, I'm sure, to those in Toronto, where you're probably bringing home something in the order of 1000 to $1,100 a month uh, for a single mother with uh, one or two children, depending on where they're living, et cetera. Um, and it's impossible on that level of income to ensure a nutritious diet. So right off the bat, the kinds of key social determinants are going to shape the outcomes for those children. Um, we certainly have lots of women in our study who talk about never being able to afford fresh fruit and vegetables for their children. Yeah, we, you know, the who's to blame, again, absolutely government is to blame on every level. Um, but, but all of us are also demanding, you know, a $44 billion health care system. And when you think, you know, if you took half a billion dollars, you could lift every teenage mom out of, preg out of poverty in Ontario. Every teenage mom in Ontario would be out of poverty, half a billion dollars. And, you know, if you, instead of just giving that money out, you put it into programs that we know are long-term effective, pay back five, six dollars to one, you'd not only be saving the government money, um, you'd, you'd be, you'd be making enormous differences in people's lives in empowering ways that give them the skills that they need for success. So, so absolutely, it's, it's, a, it's a political question. Um, it's also a value question. And you've got, you've got some ideologies, some value systems that are going to ignore every fact on this issue. And they're not going to trust the studies and they're going to say, well, it's their own fault. It's their own decisions. Pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Well, we can take that attitude. Uh, we can turn our backs on, you know, low income or teenage moms if we want to. But those are costs that we're going to have to pay sooner or later. You know, we'll pay it in health care. We'll pay it in social assistance. We'll pay it in terms of the, the gradual decay of our, of our sense of community, of our, you know, the strength of our society. So why not invest a little bit now? Now, Chris just mentioned uh, investing money in teen, teen <coughs> mothers uh, to help bring them out of poverty. I'm wondering if there are any other sort of first steps that we can talk about to, that, that would take us towards correcting these uh, poor maternal health outcomes. Neil? Why do you always choose me for Because <laughs> <laughs> um, you look smart. <laughs> I'll have plastic surgery <laughs> um, at my own expense. Um, actually, you know, I, I'd like Chris to address that one, please. All right. Chris, to you. Boy, again, you know, if there were easy <laughs> solutions, it would be done by now. Um, so I mentioned the Nurse Family Partnership. This is a, this is a program where um, uh, before the child is even born, about 20 weeks gestational age, so halfway through the pregnancy, the, the, the mom gets partnered with a nurse, and that person supports them throughout up to the child's second year birthday. And the whole goal is to empower people to be excellent parents, to be using the attachment style parenting that we know makes a big difference, um, to be engaging the kids, stimulating the, the child so that, again, they get on the right trajectory, prepare them better for school, um, but also to, to help the mother take control of her own life. Uh, often um, these really high-risk moms that haven't had a real friend in their lives. Um, they haven't had a good family upbringing themselves. They don't know what it's like to be loved. And the relationships they build with the nurse over that two years, same person every visit, uh, really powerful. Now this is an intervention that's targeted at a really high needs group, so um, low income, first time um, uh, teenage moms. Uh, but, but there's also, you know, I, I like to think of it uh, in terms of a dose of prevention for 
the appropriate, do, you know, um, the appropriate dose of prevention. So, so for for other moms, I mean, um, my wife has had a couple of babies in the last couple of years, and and we had uh, the opportunity to speak with a public health nurse, and 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 both of those times. Um, it, it, you know, you get answers to questions that uh, you otherwise wouldn't be able to find. There's so much garbage on the internet that, yeah, you can go looking on the internet and find a thousand wrong answers. Um, but you get somebody with credibility, you can ask a question. So I think, you know, NFP, Nurse Family Partnership, is one end of the spectrum, but we need a, a spectrum of, of care and support for the spectrum of needs that are out there. Um, I really think that outreach is powerful because it gets the people who need it most, who aren't going to come and seek the passive system that we have in the healthcare system. Um, and and uh, an empowerment model is really powerful as well. Um, you know, for the people that want, want um, teenage moms to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, well, let's make sure they have boots with straps. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's give them those tools um, rather than just giving a fish, let's let's teach them how to fish and and give them tools to to absolutely uh, take control of their own lives and and be the, the you know the the good parent that they want to be. But you know, Chris, there, there's also an element of myth busting that has to be done. You know, not just in our community but in other communities. I was surprised. You know, there have been comments to the series, comments to me. Um, I'm surprised by the sort of vitriolic response that an issue like teen mothers raises with certain people. There are people who who look at this as some sort of bizarre money-making operation that's going on across the city, that there's some cabal of, of pregnant teens that are doing this as some sort of get-rich-quick scheme. When the realities, you know, I mean, this, you know, Leah mentioned, you know, single teen moms living on a thousand, eleven hundred dollars a month. Can you possibly imagine what it must be like to try to live your life as a parent on that kind of monthly income? I, I mean, it's it's horrifying. And yet, we still have this sort of myth in the community that that people are doing this as some sort of money-making scheme. That they're somehow um, you know, you know, getting rich and and you know, the, pulling the wool over all of our eyes when, you know, really it's you know nothing of the sort. And and you know that sort of speaks to this whole issue of you know what what almost seems like a social Darwinism. You know, where we're just you know we have a, a path we can choose to go down a, a path where we support each other. I know this sounds very socialistic. Um, or we have this path where it's just basically everyone fends for themselves, it's survival of the fittest, and you know, if I make it, great, if you don't make it, too bad for you. And, and I, I don't know how you break those myths. Thanks, Steve. Um, before we take a quick break, I just wanted to raise one more topic that I'm hoping that Steve might be able to touch on a bit more. I'm gonna move outside of Hamilton now. We had an opportunity to fly up to some remote native reserves in Ontario's far north. And in those areas of the province, uh, some of these connections between poor birth outcomes um, and poverty, uh, low educational attainment, low income are, are extremely pronounced. Um, I'm wondering if maybe you could just address some of the barriers uh, that would exist to, to helping sort of resolve these issues in, in the far north. Yeah, you know, you know, I've thought a lot about this uh, since we made our trip up there in September. Obviously, you know, the issue of remote native reserves has been top of mind for a lot of people with the situation in uh, Attawapiskat with the, the housing situation. But, you know, both Terry and I, it's, it was my, uh, it's my first time. I've lived in the north before, but never have I been up to the sort of the remote, remote fly-in part of the north where the only way in or out for much of the year is on an airplane. And when you go there, it's, you can't help but land in the plane and think, good Lord, you know, the only way in and out is, is by a plane. How, how, it just seems so foreign to us down here where you can hop in your car, hop on the bus, hop on the train, wherever, go wherever you like. There's no barrier to, to your travel. I can't even imagine what, 
kind of mindset you would have to live in a community where basically at, you know, at the end of your community, the road comes to an end and that's it. And, you know, if you want to drive your car out, you wait till uh, the middle of January when an ice road is built and it's 12 hours to get from, in our case, Big Trout Lake down to Pickle Lake, which is civilization, you know. Uh, to, to live in a place where you look at a, a community like Sioux Lookout as being the big city, you know, where most people here wouldn't even know where Sioux Lookout is. T to people in Big Trout Lake, that's going to the city. You know, they have a hospital there. And so, wow, good Lord, you know, I can't, I can't imagine. So, I, I mean, so many of the issues that they deal with in these remote fly-in reserves seem to be based primarily on just this lack of, of uh, attachment to, you know, the rest of the province. I mean, um, when that is your only community and those are the only people that you know, it's no wonder that you have huge, um, highly elevated rates of teen mothers, uh, substance abuse problems, and, you know, boy, a lot of these issues are coming to light right now, and, and I don't know what the solution is. I, just, just one sort of follow-up question. Uh, we're so detached from them, um, I mean, in, in terms of geography and in terms of culture. How do, how do we make people here in, in central Ontario care about improving maternal health outcomes? Yeah, well, I, I mean, you, you know, it's, at some point it's back to sort of what Neil was saying in the first place. You know, the children of this province are the children of all of us. And, you know, I, I, I don't think that we can divorce ourselves from that. I mean, at some, at some point we, we're either all equal citizens or, or we're not. And if we're not, then, you know, that's a far bigger discussion that we need to have. Terry, if, if I could just add a bit. Absolutely. Um, I worked in a, a northern native uh, reserve town of about 500 people in, in when I was a medical student in Manitoba. And what you see there is what you see around the world in uh, places um, with you know similar socioeconomic circumstances. If people don't have opportunities, they have children. And, you know, um, there's an expression, the rich grow richer, the poor grow children. And, you know, it's, 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 um, it's part of human nature to want our, our family to do well. And if we can't do that by, you know, going to school, getting a job, and providing a stable foundation, then the other route is to have lots and lots of children, and a couple of them are going to survive well enough to, to, you know, take care of us when we're old. And that's a pattern you see around the world. And um, in every country where you have developing, you know, developing world conditions, you see the birth rate being extremely high. And and over um, over time, as as nations develop and and um, you know um, and lives become more stable and 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 opportunities become greater, you see that birth rate drop off. And that's been consistent absolutely everywhere in the world. Um, the the one place um, that kind of on the one hand, it's an exception, but on the other hand, proves the rule, is, uh, is the country Cuba, where uh, you still have, in terms of gross domestic product, in terms of income levels, you have, you know, third world conditions. Um, but what they've done is they have invested in children. They have invested in community-based health care that reaches out to people in neighborhoods. And they've also invested in education so that there's no... There's no illiteracy there, for example. Um, and every, every person that wants to go on and get secondary education can. There's no barriers there, so they have opportunities. And they actually are doing as well as Canada, in many cases, better on things like, um, you know, teenage pregnancy, absolutely. Uh, low birth weight even. You know, the, the tiny, impoverished nation of Cuba does, does better than, you know, North America. So um, there, there are solutions there. And, and, you know, at their core, they are political decisions and, and political solutions. Can I just add one tiny thing to just second something that Chris said? Absolutely. And I, I think that is the importance of education in all of the understanding of this piece. Um, and I'm not surprised to hear that Cuba does better from a health outcomes perspective because of their investment in education. And 
I haven't perhaps looked closely enough at the maps, but if you were to then lay over the maps that were done as a part of this series, um, the percentage of kids who graduate from high school in each of those high schools in those poor neighborhoods, I think one would find a continuing correlation that suggests that in those neighborhoods, education is not available equitably. Um, and the kind of quality education that actually moves people into places where they can actually get job opportunity. And, um, you know, one third of the Canadian workforce now, and this is a pretty stunning figure, especially in a country like Canada, one third of the Canadian workforce is now without employment standards protections. So what that means is that we've gone from a highly unionized, highly regulated workforce where we were all protected when we went to work to now one third, one out of every three workers has none of the protections that ensure that they don't have to work endless overtime, that they don't have to kind of, that they have some job security, et cetera. And that's a major shift that's happened in the last 20 years in Canada. And so for people who do get jobs at that low end, low skilled work, it's at minimum wage and it's without those kinds of employment protections. Many of the women we interviewed, if they are working, are working at two to three jobs. They're juggling the kind of part-time work across the time span, which is obviously pretty difficult if you've got kids at home and we don't have a national daycare program. So I think education is really at the heart of how you kind of start to build equality. And we used to have more of that and we've really lost it. And it's just a, a slight illustration of that. Um, people who are on social assistance in Ontario cannot access OSAP, the Ontario Student Assistance Program because that's seen as double dipping. So the very benefit that would help people move into post-secondary education and get some skills that would let them get secure employment is prohibited. So I think education really is an important starting point. Thanks so much, Lee. When we come back, we're going to be taking public questions. So, uh, so think about those. We're now moving into the portion where we're going to take some questions from the audience. So uh, we'll get started with this, um, this lady with the green sweater on. I did enjoy the article, but I was um, a bit disappointed in that uh, there wasn't any mention of the Canada Prenatal Nutrition Program, which is a federally funded program that started in 1994 and targets uh, the risk groups that uh, you mentioned in your article. And uh, within Hamilton, uh, there are actually three projects, an Aboriginal project, a Francophone project, and uh, the Hamilton Prenatal Nutrition Project, which I coordinate. And um, we have over 500 participants per year, and uh, we do have um, varied ranges of ages of mums, uh, with some very young mums attending. And uh, we, the program addresses the social determinants of health. Uh, participants receive a $10 gift certificate to help them purchase nutritious foods weekly and uh, also learn cooking skills. Um, we do have um, public health staff uh, involved in uh, educational sessions at the, the groups. And uh, our results are um, more women uh, breastfeeding uh, and uh, for a longer duration. And we also have lower numbers of low birth weight babies. So my question is, um, was it overlooked because it's federally funded and you're focusing on provincial programs, or were you not familiar with um, the Hamilton Prenatal Nutrition Project? Yeah, I don't think it was so much a case of, of it being overlooked. I mean, as you know, this is a, you know, it wasn't intentionally overlooked in the sense that, you know, we just decided not to include. I mean, there was lots of areas that we could have delved into. I mean, we've we've heard similar things from some of the uh, agencies that deal with teen moms and um, you know this wasn't intended to be a retro you know a, a, a list of every single resource that's that's available for 
any potential teen mum in the city. It, it was more to give a, f a flavor about, you know, what's what the problem is, and you know, and then of course the third part of the of the series did look at some of the the solutions. So it certainly wasn't intentionally overlooked, and I'm glad that you've had the opportunity to uh, to at least talk a bit uh, a bit about the program. Well, thank you, and uh, I'm glad that you were familiar with the program and recognized the value of the program to the City of Hamilton. Uh, it has been here for over 15 years, and uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada is always commending us for the great jobs that we're doing in the city. And so, even though we are working with just 500 women, uh, we w could easily handle more. So if anybody is aware of high-risk uh, women who would enjoy participating, we would certainly love to have them. And certainly builds a, a lot of social support for the women. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think it, it's kind of interesting in this city that um, we hold the newspaper accountable for solving some of our problems. I, I think the spectator's done a really fantastic job of, of highlighting this issue, and that's their role, and it's up to the rest of us to, uh, to you know, put the political pressure on and to run the programs, the great programs like uh, CPNP that we do uh, to address the problem. Thanks, Chris. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name's Erica. I work at the Social Planning and Research Council and I support a collaborative The Young Parent Network. And I think I sort of want to echo um, the message that just came before me um, regarding some of the success stories that are happening. There are lots of stats out there, but there are stories and there are success stories happening in this community. Um, and I just want to highlight that the Young Parent Network, they're seeing really great outcomes with the young parents they work with. Um, I would encourage you to maybe um, chat with us and follow up with us. Um, and they include Angela's Place, Grace Haven, and St. Martin's Manor. So they're really working with sort of a core group of young parents. Um, and I'm really appreciating this series and the panel today was great um, in bringing up the social determinants of health because sort of the purpose of the Young Parent Network is to acknowledge that it's it's beyond health, it's about education, it's about employment, it's about needing supportive housing, um, and but of course health care is a very important aspect of that. So um, I guess I just want to really emphasize that there's a lot of work happening and we, we need to maybe bring more attention to that and to bring more support to that. So I guess another piece of what I kind of I'm wondering is if we're talking about um, making our governments more accountable, how do we maybe go about doing that to engage them more? We would certainly appreciate having more of that support. So that's sort of my thought. And I'm also kind of wondering in terms of next steps, what do you think would maybe be some other ideal sort of next steps to happen? Um, yeah, so I'll leave that thought with you to respond to. Well, there's one, th one thing I'd like to address right off the bat because um, we've heard from the Young Parent Network in the wake of the publication of our series. And there's just something I want to try to clear up b because at no point in the series did we say that being a teen mother is akin to a death sentence or, or that it's, it's as if you've acquired some sort of fatal disease. You know, obviously we've heard from people around the city who are uh, you know, the, as Chris mentioned, you know, these success stories. Mm -hmm. w we never suggested for a moment that there aren't success stories. The purpose of the series was to show very clearly that there are certain trends happening in certain places. We didn't say that if you become a teen mother, then you're automatically sentenced to death. That's not it at all. We're just pointing out that, like it or not, this is, this is the way the maps look. This is where these problems are happening. These are the trends. These are the connections that we're seeing. And it's very clear that you're not seeing some of these same things happen in other places. And, you know, but that doesn't mean that there aren't teen moms in the Sherman, Wentworth, Barton Street area that aren't going to make it and aren't going to, to survive. But the fact remains, it's going to be very difficult for, certain, for people in certain neighborhoods to, to do that. Will, will some of them do it? Yes, absolutely. Are there supports out there that will help them? Absolutely. You know, we certainly did talk about Grace Haven and St. Martin's Manor and Angela's Place. 
that's in fact where we conducted some of our interviews. So, um, but it's it's this idea, you know. Yes, people will will strive will, or will th thrive. It's just more difficult in certain places. Neil, you wanted to weigh in on that. No, I just want to make a comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are many agencies engaged in this area. Let's call it reproductive care for want of a better umbrella term. Obviously there's public health, there's social planning and research council, and there's, there's many, many others. Some are highly focused and some, some not. But uh, as you sort of travel through the health system, and it, this is common to a great many other of the, of the major health issues facing society, what you have is a jam session, as I put it, I think, in one of the things I wrote. It's a jam session because you have all of these deeply committed people trying to achieve objectives, and many of them do achieve objectives at a local level with sometimes small numbers of people, and that's great. But when you look at the number of agencies, all with their different governance systems and accountabilities, and everything else, it's a jam session. Everybody's doing their own thing. And I would argue that one of the things that would perhaps lead to more coherence in this would ultimately benefit everybody if all of these agencies were in a position, if that was possible, to sort of bring it together so that there wasn't, the, wasn't duplication. I'm not suggesting that you duplicate what other people do. I'm saying that the possibility exists if there isn't that coherence and the ways that that potentially can introduce into things as well. So. Let's, um, let's go back. Uh, I, I know you're asking a question about government accountability. Um, so how, how do we motivate, do you, I take it you mean the provincial government? Any level of government. Any level of government. How, how do we motivate the government to get involved? <laughs> I thought we were taking off. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I, I work in government. Um, you know, there's, there's many, many people in government that are motivated by um, altruistic means, um, both elected and you know, on the on the on the, on the civil servant uh, side, they're they're limited in many cases by the support that they do or don't get from the community. And if somebody in government were to um, change the world to solve this problem in a way that the community didn't support, they wouldn't be in the government for very long. They either you know lose their job or they become unelected. Um, so it is really about us and our, the values that we share as a community and how we do or don't choose to spread this message, how we do or don't choose to make our voice heard so that you know, we may be just one person, but if, we, if we're speaking loudly, we can make it clear that we hold, you know, we, we hold this issue as a high priority. Um, so you know, again, when, when we're pointing fingers, there's always at least three, sometimes four, pointed back at ourselves. And um, I think, you know, uh, uh, if, if we want to change on this issue, we need to, as a community, make it really clear that we want that change or it's not going to happen. <coughs> Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kayla. Um, I have three kids of my own. I am on OW. and. I get $300 to live on and they take all my child support away from me and they do not give me a cent for my kids. Um, I have a comment towards Leah. Um, I, we, I run a young moms group and um, we didn't like the fact that you said we didn't have really any aspirations that why it was okay for us to get pregnant. Um, I do have a lot of aspirations. A lot of our mothers do have a lot. Um, we did take the wrong turn in life and we did get pregnant. But you know what, we finished high school and when a lot of us all have businesses or we are attending to get employment. As of September, I will be opening my own daycare with three kids who have medical issues. May I respond, sir? Uh, my profound apologies if I gave you a message that I think that 
teen moms or any single mom, whether on a social assistance or not, has no aspirations. I simply meant to suggest that the aspirations that all young people feel get thwarted for people who are growing up in poverty because they don't necessarily see that they can realize them. So the last thing I would ever suggest ever is that people don't have those aspirations, but I think that we've got a, a system where there's such extraordinary levels of inequality that many people feel like there really isn't much hope in terms of being able to kind of manifest their aspirations. They're not going to be able to actualize them. So that's what I was suggesting, not that, not that people didn't have them. And I, I thank you for raising the issue around child support. I mean, I don't know the extent to which the audience um, recognizes that in Ontario we have a system where child support, if you're on Ontario Works, which is the social assistance system, um, and for a single parent, 85% of whom are single moms, um, if the uh, child's father or children's father are paying child support, that's deducted from the Ontario Works benefit dollar for dollar. So for those families, even though the father is contributing, there's no net benefit to the family. They're just as poor as if the father didn't contribute at all. So it creates a real disincentive for fathers to contribute and also leaves mothers very vulnerable to abuse where um, we have uh, one of the women that we interview, um, her um, ex-partner, the father of her kids, um, has for 18 years not paid a cent in child support and sh that's deducted from her check because he threatens that if she ever reports that it's not paid, um, he'll beat her up. Um, so she duly reports that she receives the child support and has it cut from her check. Um, so there's a real problem in many, many ways with the way in which the social assistance system is structured, including the fact that child support gets deducted from, from a check. So I thank you for raising that issue. And also, um, we don't class ourselves as living in poverty. We have a family, we are loved, and we also have a roof over our head, and we can provide for food on the table for our children and ourselves. So we're not living in poverty. Thanks. Good evening. My name is uh, Dave Carson. Um, I've got sort of a. I'd like to hear some comments from the panel and also suggest where uh, studies might go in the future with respect to food and food education. Um, while we have this massive uh, bill for our provincial health care, we have, as we hear, ep oncoming epidemics in terms of both diabetes and obesity. And a lot of, I perceive a lot of it is because people don't eat right. Um, we have uh, large quantities of sugar and salt in our diets. Uh, I was ha happened to be in a, a store in the, the north end uh, just recently, and four of the five aisles were basically packets of chips and cookies and uh, large rows of um, soft drink coolers. So I, I guess my, I've got questions first of all and then, and then perhaps an opportunity here. We're currently working on a food charter for Hamilton which is trying to look at what should be the healthy, affordable, uh, culturally um, acceptable food that should be available to everybody. And we're trying to look at what should it take to put that in place. And my question perhaps would be first of all for Leah would be in your interviews, do, do you perceive a, a full awareness of the, the, the pitfalls of the types of food that people eat? And this is not just the people in poverty, of course. It's our whole population is, is eating wrong uh, in, in many respects. So education in, in, in terms of what it takes for nutrition in the schools, to me, is a, a great, very important and can do a lot to free up healthcare dollars to spend in the right place. So that, I'd like to hear a comment on the level of education and understanding of our general population on, on that condition. <coughs> and then offer to Steve and, and, and uh, the spec that there's an opportunity here to look into this in much more detail and talk about what should be put in place for a healthy food system in Hamilton and in Ontario. I certainly thank you for the, for the question. I mean, the full food security issue is it's much more salient in the lives of people on social assistance than I think most of us can even imagine. I mean, my, my work has, has um, 
focused in poverty and long before I became an academic, I did um, frontline work with, with homeless people. So um, I thought I knew, but we have lots of women who talk about the fact that these are people who are on social assistance, single moms, um, that they don't have enough money left from a welfare check and from the National Child Benefit to actually buy food. The food that they rely on to feed their families comes from the food banks. Um, and food banks do a great job, um, but food banks can't provide fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, and so people are reliant on canned food. Um, often uh, people are worried about food that's passed best before dates. Um, it's difficult if you don't have internet access to know just how risky that is. Um, you can't do very much research on it. Um, so people are scared about food. And we certainly have many, many, many women talk about, I mean, a woman by the name of Janet's comment resonates still. We end our interviews by asking people what they'd like, what they kind of wish for, for their families. And Janet says, what I'd really love is to have a fridge with food in it all the time for my kids. Um, and most of us think about fridges having food, um, not having fridges that are, are empty, maybe a little bottle of old mustard as all that's in many, many people's fridges. So people were very cognizant, though, of the need to give their kids fruit and vegetables, to buy fresh food, um, but had a real kind of issue with affordability. Um, and lots of people talked about the kind of stress that they felt in terms of managing, volunteering, part-time work, um, the kind of being the sole caregiver for their children, and the need to kind of save somewhere, and that's where the bags of chips come in. Um, that it's easier, it's faster, they feel kind of stressed at the end of a day, and so the preparation of a healthy meal was more than they could cope with. And just, just to echo that, um, Hamilton Public Health does a fair bit of work on food security, and, and uh, you know, the obesity uh, epidemic is, is a major concern of ours. Um, and on this issue, like many issues, education is, is part of the solution. Um, but access is, is a, a much bigger part. So whether it's financial access or whether it's because, you know, that, that uh, store that you walk through in the North End has, you know, four, four rows worth of, of stuff that we would barely even classify as food. Uh, oh, you forgot to mention chocolate bars. There was probably a row of that. So, um, but, you know, if you can't, if you can't, if you don't have a car, you, you can't afford a taxi, you can't get to a place where there is good quality food, that's a huge issue. If your, you know, your welfare check is $590 a month and your uh, rent is $510 a month, you know, that buys a lot of chips but not a lot of apples. Um, so access is a, is a huge, huge part of that and that's a much, you know, uh, more complicated issue to solve. Hello, my name is Pat. I am a born and raised Hamiltonian and love this city and went into education at a young age and spent 25 years working with kids within a system. I am not a person who fits within the box and found it necessary to leave the system because I also saw, in spite of wonderful teachers, a lot of kids suffering. Some children just cannot work within a box. In the last 10 or 12 years in community work, I am putting a plea here to Hamilton because I will agree with the panel on many things, but one in particular. Because I have chosen to step out of a career that, that certainly did well from a, a payment perspective to a career where I'm competing and often viewed to be a threat with so many people holding the cards close to their chests with organizations and agencies loaded with wonderful people and their heart in the right place but sadly with an attitude that they need to protect and defend. And there's two things I really would just end with a comment to the Hamiltonians. We can be competitive or we can be collaborative, but we can't be both. Would anyone on the panel like to, <laughs> to speak to the issue maybe of, uh, of collaboration? Yeah, I mean, it was actually the first Code Red series that, um, that um, brought our attention in public health in part to the low birth weight issue because it was highlighted there, uh, although not to the same degree. And we're actually working with a number of community partners right now, uh, agencies of the community, trying to figure out how we can collaborate better because, you know, as I think Neil has really uh, pointed out that we're, you know, jam session. I think 
we'd rather be an orchestra with uh, you know a conductor and all playing from the same um, same songbook. So so that's that's a big part of the solution. It's an, you know we know there aren't going to be any major new uh, injections of funding in the, in the short term. Certainly where our provincial and federal governments are with the deficit situation, it's going to be very difficult. So um, so collaboration is one of the ways we can take the the few resources that we have and stretch them even further. So I think the, the speaker made a great point. Thanks, Chris. We're going to take these two, uh, two final questions. We should have time for those. Thank you. My name's May. I'm, a, I'm imported from Scotland <laughs> 100 years ago. <laughs> um, I'm, you see before me a low birth weight baby. I was born full term low birth weight to a toxic mother and uh, when she grew up when i i was old enough and when i was doing midwifery training i got her obstetric history i got the ex, ex, the obstetric history of most of the females in the extended family also but mother's diet w would make your hair stand on end because this was 1935 and life wasn't that good um, Anyway, uh, as you can see, I survived. And so if you've, you've now met somebody who got wrapped in cotton wool and put in a drawer and fed in with uh, cream, not milk. Anyway, here I am. Uh, I have a few things to say, I guess, from my, uh, from my experience, and that's it for my own history. But... Um, I taught obstetric nursing for, for some years here in North America. I also was in America periodically, so I have sort of both Canadian and American experience. Uh, I think uh, one of the things you need to think about is, is the culture, the culture difference between some of your uh, patients or clients uh, and, uh, and, and the, the worker who is trying to give the service, whatever it is. Um, over the years, I've found some people who uh, can interact very well with some of the, I'm, I'm, my experience is patients rather than um, students in, a, in another workplace. But um, some kind of can get into the head of the, the person more so than others, so uh, I I don't know what we do about that, except if you know that you're very good, you, you're quite good at it, then maybe that's what you should do. If you know that you're not, find a way of getting somebody else to assist that person with that particular problem. Um, I'm pleased that now the Ontario government is uh, acting on the, the study, the, the early education study that was uh, spearheaded by Fraser Mustard because I think part of what we need to do is uh, get the beginning of education started sooner. Uh, I think that will help both the people who would have processed their child well anyway, but also the people who have not the same opportunities to process their child. They have a better chance with some sort of Head Start program than they have uh, sitting at home with the child. Um, also, I think uh, when I was doing a, a course in Boston, uh, we, uh, th the other nurse and I followed a group of mothers, and uh, that's p fairly typical of what you tend to do, uh, prenatally and so on. And I found that some of the mothers really use that. So most of the pregnancy that we had them, uh, they were getting extra information from us. In fact, one, one young woman did it. I thought she was really smart. Uh, I, we asked her how she got her information when everything was finished. And uh, she said, well, if it was the beginning of the week and I was going to see you or your partner, I, gave, I asked this question, and if it was the end of the week, the public health nurse was coming to see me, and I did that. And I thought that was really good. Uh, another thing about that experience, the, the clients in the, uh, in the prenatal clinic that I was uh, learning from, 
use the nurses uh, to get some information. They rarely use the obstetrical residents. Uh, the social class difference seemed to make it difficult for them to speak to them, even when the language was easier for them because there was a lot of Spanish-American patients doing this. So I think that's something we all need to think about, how we can bridge any cultural gra gap that there is. Okay. I think I could go on, but I think that's probably enough. That's actually it's something that we encountered uh, when we visited Six Nations. Um, they have some wonderful programs. Yes, yes, um, yes. I've known about that for some time. We're, we're going to have to and take that. And class. in some of the places up north, because uh, I, I was up north for a while, um, they do fairly well. For others, not quite so well. Uh, but it's very bad to, to have to bring your mother down to a major center um, and Absolutely. quite a number of weeks before they expected to have the baby because the social break with the extended family is possibly, from their point of view, worse than anything they gain by coming down. Thank you very Thank much. You. Those are all really valuable points. And, oh. <laughs> so we're going to take this one last question uh, before we wrap up our public forum for the night. My name's Hal. Um, I, uh, I'm proud to, to live in a city where we can have a discussion like this tonight. Um, what I think is important and is, as, as has been identified, that it is actually is a political issue that has to be dealt with at the political level as well as at the personal level. And it seems to me that one of the problems that we have as a society is that by and large, and in speaking very broadly, the people who vote don't have the direct experience with the kind of poverty uh, that you've talked about in the code red. And the people who do have that kind of experience, by and large, are not uh, voting in the same kind of proportion as the rest of us. Uh, I happen to be a numbers guy, and, and I love data, and I love statistics, and it means something to me. I can get the picture. I think in order to be successful with this kind of issue, we need the, the narratives. We need to put a real face on this. We need to have the kind of interviews that, that, that Leah is doing and the stories that she's talked about, and some of the stories that, that you have covered in, in, in The Spectator. So I, I'm wondering if, if it would be possible, and I don't know whether this is asking too much, you know, sort of an off-the-cuff thing. Are, are there some really powerful narrative stories? You've already told us a couple uh, tonight, Leah. Are there, are there some more that you can share with us? Because I think that's really important in making the political changes that are necessary. Um, we interviewed 140 women across the country five times over five years. So. Um, we have many, many stories, um, and and they're all equally rich. And just just to pick up on on one, and we've talked a little bit about education before, but this is a story from Terry, who's a First Nations woman living in downtown Vancouver on the downtown east side of Vancouver, which is one of the poorest um, neighborhoods in North America. Um, and Terry talked about the fact that in her family, her extended family, no one has ever finished high school. And she talked about the fact that because we interviewed over that long period of time and we hired single mothers on social assistance and trained them as peer interviewers, um, so they developed a relationship with the people that they were interviewing and we had very little attrition fall off over that period of time because the women we were interviewing began to kind of want to be a part of our project. They wanted to tell their stories and so we'd have them call to say, I've moved. Um, so when you come to interview us in a few months, you know, I want to make sure that you know where to find me. Um, and, and back to Terry, um, over the course of that period of time, um, just because she had this opportunity to kind of reflect on her life circumstance um, and be in an environment where there were some supports for her, she began to reflect on her own children and their opportunities for education. And over that five-year period of time, she moved her uh, two children to a different high school um, at an extraordinary amount of 
cost and hassle out of a local school where it was a kind of dead-end school. There wasn't an expectation on the part of teachers um, that kids would graduate, that they would go anywhere. And she began to talk eloquently about the fact that her kids were going to be the first in her extended family um, to graduate high school. And the experience, of course, of the kids, because it's, you know, this is a family with a family dynamic. And as those kids began to kind of see their educational futures differently, um, they began to kind of work on their mother about what they ate and what kinds of household they wanted to live in and why there weren't books. And so, you know, there are those kinds of stories that give you just kind of little glimmers of how family can change when they get just a little bit of support. Um, we brought a group of 17 women, and just it's a plug for the Ontario Trillium Foundation that supported us to develop a little pilot project where we brought 17 or 18 women together, and they met once a month through the whole life of the project. And their only the only task or goal of the group was for those women to support each other. And over the course of that, we saw women who um, managed successfully to overcome addictions. Um, people do really extraordinary things. So um, there are many stories that are, are extraordinarily rich um, that give just a little bit of insight into what kind of possibility when people get the kinds of supports that they need and when they get a message of value. Um, Amartya Sen talks about the fact that one of the impacts of poverty isn't just material deprivation, but a lack of feeling of worthiness to be in the public realm. And with that lack of feeling of being worthy, um, one doesn't feel like one can make a case. One can't say, hey, we need to do something about inequality. One doesn't vote. One doesn't feel equal as a citizen. And I think those are some of the kinds of issues that we need to, to take head on. You know, I'll tell one quick little anecdote here. Um, maybe to wrap it up, <clears throat> you know, when I did the first Code Red project, I spoke to a young woman, she was 20 or 21 at the time, and she had four children, which in and of itself is a challenge I can't even imagine. And just, we were chatting, and she sort of had a, a throwaway line as we were discussing something, and she said, oh yeah, um, because we were talking about the cycle, you know, this, this cycle that we just have such a tough time breaking of teen mom becoming, you know, uh, the children of a teen mom becoming a teen mom and, you know, on and on it goes. And she just sort of casually said to me, oh yeah, my, my kids have a great, great grandmother. And I thought, I can't even imagine living in a family where your kids could have a great, great grandmother. That just shows you how that cycle doesn't get broken, you know. You know, I, I'm I'm very proud that that Terry and myself and, and Neil and Chris has been part of both projects here too. You know, I'm very proud that, like you said, that you know that that we can have this kind of discussion in this city. I'm I'm very thankful that the Spectator has been able to shine a light on this. But you know, there's only so much that we can do, and at some point that has to move away from the newspaper and out into the general community. And, you know, I think that's, that's a good place to leave it. It's up, it's up to everyone in the community to try to figure out a solution to this. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, thank you all uh, so much for coming tonight. That's all we're gonna have time for. Thank you also to our panelists, and have a fantastic evening. Thank you.